Thank you, Anne, and thank you, Joe, for the invitation. Four years ago, in 2012, there was a Shannad public consultation. Ten years earlier, in 2002, there was a working group, while back in 1988, there was a government working party. For almost 30 years, official working groups have been looking at the ways in which we should support older people. And for all of those years, they've been recommending that older people should have statutory rights to a range of home and community services. What would that mean? Well, it would mean there were entitlements, guarantees that individuals could access services. Statutory rights would require there to be clarity about what services were guaranteed and on what basis. There'd have to be equality of access around the country. And perhaps most importantly, while these services could be funded in any number of ways, funding would have to be made available. Services wouldn't be grace and favour based, they'd be rights based. At the moment, when it comes to entitlements for older people, I think most of us probably think of them in terms of the Nursing Home Support Scheme Act, or as it's better known, Fair Deal. Now, Fair Deal doesn't actually give a statutory right to care in the sense that if state funding dries up, an older person can't demand the support, but it does enable the state to support older people financially in paying for their own nursing home care, and it does so on an equitable basis as long as the funding remains. So it comes close. But while it comes close, there's no equivalent scheme and certainly no statutory right in existence in this country for home and community services. And so here this afternoon, I want to pose the questions, is that okay? Is it justifiable? And from a human rights perspective, is it even or will it continue to be lawful? We must all age, of course, and study after study has found that as we do, what we want is to stay at home. The good news is that government policy echoes that, stating that its aim is indeed to keep us in our homes and in our communities for as long as possible. But, but policy is one thing, reality is another. And when it comes to reality, it's clear that funding and attention are not going to home and community services. Take, for example, May. That recently, UCD and the Irish Association of Social Workers, along with some NGOs, said in a research paper that older people's preference for receiving care and support in their home and community is simply not being realised. Other parties, meanwhile, have looked at the real revealer, the bottom line, and what have they found? Well, the Alzheimer's Society discovered that between 2009 and 2015, funding for home care was cut, while funding for long-term residential care increased. And the Care Alliance points to last year's budget measure. It, we're told, increased the fair deal allocation by 35 million euro, at the same time as it aimed to reduce spending on older people services, which are mostly home care services, by almost 10 million. It wasn't a name that was realised. Just last month, the Minister for Health intervened and pledged more funding for home care. But even while he did that, the Care Alliance is warning that the HSE seems to have reduced its target hours of home help per client. In 2000, it says the target was about eight hours per week. Now, in 2016, it says it's just over four a week. So is this okay? When it comes to older people, is it okay for us to leave a legislative gap in the area of home and community services and to channel our funding into residential care, even though as a group it appears that older people would prefer home and community services? Well, from a human rights perspective, perhaps not. In Ireland, we're very close to ratifying the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. We signed it in 2007, and since then, according to the government, we've been getting our house in order in or in so that we'll be in a position to comply with its demands. And two things it will demand are, firstly, that we guarantee people with disabilities the right to live in the community, the right to choose their own place of residence, and the right to the personal assistance necessary to support them living and being included in the community. And secondly, that we guarantee them the right to make their own decisions, supported to do so if necessary. And our new Assisted Decision Making Act is intended to make this part of the Convention a reality. 
And when it is a reality, it will leave older people, older people with a disability, say dementia, in an interesting position. After all, the Alzheimer's Society highlights the fact that dementia is considered a disability under Irish Equality Law and the Disability Convention. It's also believed to be one of the primary reasons, if not the primary reason, for older people being admitted to nursing homes. So what about those who perhaps don't really want to be admitted? What about those who at the moment are being perhaps nudged, persuaded, or even pressurised into a nursing home? What if some of them decide to say no? What if they say something like, under this new act, I believe I have the right to make my own decisions. I am deciding I want to remain in familiar surroundings. I want to stay at home, they might say. And I want the state to look at whether it can provide me with the support and assistance necessary to do that. Might this happen? Well, I think it might. And actually, if we really want this new act to make a difference in people's lives, we should welcome it happening. We should say, yes, it might take time, yes, it might take resources, but yes, the rights of people with disabilities to make decisions and live in the community are ones we should respect. But then, of course, we'll say, it's not just older people with disabilities. Surely, if we're going to take seriously their rights to make decisions, we will say, then we'll have to do the same for older people in general. Well, yes, of course we will. And a UN working group is actually currently devising the contents of an international convention on the rights and dignity of older people. And my bet is that the right to make one's own decisions and to live in the community will be part of that convention too. Now, what if a human rights perspective on all of this doesn't just lead us to consider the ways in which rights might be vindicated in a positive way by providing more services in the community? What if we also take a look at whether or not rights are perhaps being infringed in a negative way in the present, in some circumstances, by our preference for funding residential care? Very recently, UCD and the Irish Association of Social Workers produced a report called I'd prefer to stay at home, but I don't have a choice. The report revealed that often older people are not receiving the, the home care hours that their social workers have requested, and it concluded that a worrying consequence of this is often premature or unnecessary institutionalisation. Premature or unnecessary institutionalisation, it's a pretty big mouthful, but it's also a pretty big issue, because arguably premature or unnecessary institutionalisation, particularly when it's not what someone wants, could offend against at least two basic guarantees. One, the right to respect for a person's private and family life, and the other, the right to personal liberty. Now, interfering with a person's private or family life or depriving them of their liberty can sometimes be justified. But the interference has to be necessary and proportionate and in accordance with law. So what if a person is in residential care against their wishes, not because it's the last resort, but simply because no one is delivering the home care hours that they need? Is that care certain to be necessary and proportionate? What if the same person is actually prevented from leaving the nursing home because it's just common practice to lock all the doors? What if they are even restrained? might that amount to an unlawful deprivation of liberty? This isn't just me coming up with legal arguments to make life difficult. There are people, other people looking at these issues. Consult consultant gerontologist Dr Sean O'Keefe has spoken of his concerns about de facto imprisonment in nursing homes, while SAGE, the National Advocacy Service for Older People, contends that chemical restraint, which is the use of medication to control behaviour, rather than for therapeutic purposes, and which legally speaking can sometimes amount to a deprivation of liberty, is unfortunately still an ongoing practice um, in institutional care. So there are definitely potential problems. Without question, we need legislation to clarify whether, and if so, in what circumstances an older person can be detained or restrained against their wishes. And I understand that some may be in the pipeline, which is great. But with or without it, I would still contend that to avoid unnecessary institutionalisation against people's wishes and thereby respect older people's human rights, we need to ensure 
that sufficient home and community services are available to people. Available, but not just available. And this is the final area I want to address. It's the need to regulate the community care system to ensure its quality. Regulation is not something a state can ignore. It can't just outsource services and then take no responsibility for the quality or monitoring of them. The state is actually obliged to take effective measures to protect people from inhuman or degrading treatment where it knows or ought to know that there is a risk. This obligation applies even where the individuals or organisations posing a risk operate entirely independently of the state. The need for regulation of home care services is generally accepted. It's been recognised and called for by the Law Reform Commission. Some of you might remember a primetime undercover investigation in 2010, which revealed some appalling instances of abuse of people in their own homes. So much so that the then Taoiseach, Brian Cowan, said that the regulation of home care needed to be looked at as a matter of urgency. The HSE has brought in guidelines for home care, which it applies through its procurement process. But in 2011, the Law Reform Commission said that these guidelines were not sufficient to meet the state's obligation to regulate, not just because they only apply to providers who are contracting with the HSE, but also because they're not backed up by a statutory monitoring or inspection framework. And the rights argument goes the other way too. While that primetime programme unveiled instances of neglect from some carers, we also all know of carers who are wonderful, who go way beyond the call of duty, and they need to be protected too, I would say. Just last Sunday morning, I spoke to two women about the work that they do. One of them is the mother of a close friend of mine, and the other was one of her colleagues. They're both professional carers, they work for a private agency, and they have a number of clients um, or people that they each tend to. The care they provide is both wide-ranging and demanding. They often have to use hoists, they deal with incontinence, hydration and skin health regimes. They sometimes manage challenging behaviour, which they do in a positive, supportive way. And they help with physiotherapy exercises, they record fluid intake, continence, stools, and they attend to wounds, monitor blood pressure, and administer medication. They're not supposed to do the last three things, but they have to if no one else is available, and if public health nurses have left them with supplies and instructions. In addition to, to this, they do the basics. They help tidy the person's house, do shopping, prepare meals, and they provide the essential companionship. They also worry that's why they often band together and take turns at calling into their clients when they're off duty to check that they're okay at night time or, for example, on a hot summer's day. These particular carers work for an agency which provides its people with in-depth training and supervision and also goes to great lengths to match carers with clients. But that's one agency. They told me stories of another one where training is simply delivered online while the HSE itself drew their criticism for its relatively basic training requirements, its rates of pay, and for its recent tender, for carers to work for as short a shift with one person as half an hour. The government came into their line of fire too. They spoke about how decimated the system would be without the skill and professionalism of migrant workers from outside the EU. Migrant workers who, because of government policy of not giving work permits to home carers, are here illegally and so are vulnerable themselves to abuse and exploitation. This surely should not be acceptable to us. These carers need regulation for their protection. As I said, regulation is a rights issue which goes both ways. So in summary then, what am I really saying here this afternoon? What do I believe needs to happen? Well, most of all, I think we need to pay attention. If we pay attention to older people from a rights perspective, we realise that the three things I discussed come into play. First, that we're increasingly going to be called upon to implement people's positive rights to live in the community in accordance with their choice. Secondly, that in some cases already, the state's preference for care in nursing homes and institutions may be infringing rights in a negative way. And finally, that both older people and their carers need proper regulation, regulation which 
we have an absolute obligation to provide without delay. Thank you.